right, so we have with us on stage our panelists for the next session. That's tackling taboos to build a healthier generation. We have with us Professor Shohini Ghosh from AJK Mass Communication Research Center, India. We have Dr. Ashik Salim, lead psychiatrist from Sajeda Foundation. We have Dr. Sabina Rashid, Dean and Professor, James P. Grant School of Public Health, Bangladesh. And we have Mr. Anand Power, Executive Director from Samyak, India. And we have Ms. Silvana Kadir Sinha, Founder and CEO of Prava Health, Bangladesh, moderating the panel. And then may I request uh, Silvana Appa to please go ahead and take the conversation forward. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, a great honor to be here with these esteemed um, colleagues today and to be here with all of you. Thank you to Brack for having us. Um, I think that the introduction that was given was, was great. I think we're here to discuss really um, tackling taboos to build a healthier generation. And um, the panelists here are all approaching this from many different perspectives. I think we'd like to start out, just each of them will share a little bit about their work. Um, with each of you in, um, in terms of the challenges they face in their areas of work in terms of tackling various taboos. And then we'll open it up for a broader discussion um, and hope we'll get some questions from all of you as well. Um, would you like to start, Anand? Uh, good afternoon uh, and thank you for having me here. This is Anand and I come from Pune, India and I work with an organization called Samyak which is a communication and resource center on gender and masculinities. And I work on uh, basically on two levels. One is uh, working on men and masculinities, and the other part is working with young men and women on sexual and reproductive health rights. So that's been part of my work. And I'll elaborate more about my experiences working with young men and women and on masculinities in a while. Thank you. Hi. So we are supposed to do these quick introductions, right? OK, so my name is Shohini Ghosh. And I teach at the Mass Communication Research Center in India, which is a production school. But I've also had a very long, uh, I won't say a career, but I have a, I've had a, a, a long time interest in issues of speech and censorship and sexuality. And that's possibly you know, what I will actually talk about. Um, hi, my name's uh, Dr. Ashik Salim, uh, and I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I work for an organization called the Psychological Health and Wellness Clinic, or PHWC, based in Dhaka. Um, our primary focus is to provide high-quality individual uh, mental health care across the spectrum, so starting from life improvement, um, dealing with distress, or to all the way through to dealing with individuals with severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. We have a team of 13 uh, clinicians, three psychiatrists and 10 counselors. Uh, we also provide organizational uh, mental health support. So we send counselors to, um, for example, we send counselors to provide staff uh, support to uh, four different NGOs in Cox's Bazar. Um, and we provide some training and supervision to organizations in Dhaka as well. Um, we're recently launching um, another project which is going to be able to provide even larger uh, mental health support to organizations uh, and that's through the use of technology uh, but maybe I'll talk about that later good afternoon I hope you're awake after that nice lunch my name is Sabina Fez Rashid I am the Dean and Professor Brack School of Public Health uh, uh, other than education and training we have five research centers one of the centers focuses on gender, sexual reproductive health, rights and sexuality work, and I'll be sharing some research from there. I'm a medical anthropologist by training. I do a lot of qualitative research in ethnographies. So I promise not to do death by PowerPoint, but I want to cover some key points based on two research projects we undertook. Uh, one um, looking at digital technology and 
the Maya app that young people access in Dhaka City for information on sexual reproductive health. And the other one was a smaller study done in rural Bangladesh looking at younger boys and girls uh, and looking at their curriculum and what's missing. I hope, hope I got this right, no? I don't know how this works in terms of. Oh, that <laughs> very helpful. I feel a bit like an idiot. This whole TV screen here going through it. <laughs> yeah, does that help? Okay, and then we'll switch. Thank you, Shoini. How do I click the next? Can someone help me and say, and I can do next? Okay. Can I do next? Can I say next? Would that help? Okay, thanks. So the Center for Gender, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so next slide. It's going back and forth. Are you doing, yeah. So one we do have is, if you go back a slide, Silvana. That's all right. Yeah. So one, we do know that, I, I thought this is a very apt panel to be on because there's taboos, but there's levels of taboos. There's a cultural silence, there's social silence, and then you've got young people in the mix. And we've also got an increasing group of young people that we don't know much about. Uh, an urban Dhaka, you've got rural areas, you've got social media, you've got interconnected by many different kinds of exposure. So I don't think we actually understand the landscape of young people, but we do understand there's taboos. On top of that, there's shame and stigma and conservative attitudes, but there's also spaces where people are changing and they are engaging in behaviors that would be considered risky or be frowned upon. But the reality is that we need to uh, address some of this or at least reach out to them through information. Next slide, please. So these are the two projects. I just, you can go to the next slide. One is Digital Sister. And it was a mixed method, huge survey with qualitative. We worked with Maya that provides information online. So it's mainly educated young students or young people writing online for information. Doctors mainly giving uh, in, uh, help or advice. Next. So what did they find? They found there's a lot of issues and barriers where parents, cultural, sexuality, education, it's very biomedicalized, it's very biology based. You don't have the discussions around emotional and mental health. And also when they sorry, go to... Can you define SRHR? Oh, so SRHR is, sorry, this is the world I live in, sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, and when they were talking about their sexual and reproductive health needs, they felt there was many different levels of barriers from the home to external to the medical or service clinics. Because generally you can't have certain conversations if you're unmarried, if you're gay, if you're uh, you know, in a relationship, um, even married and with someone else. So all of these sorts of barriers come into play. Um, the main issue that came up in both our studies that we didn't expect to find, and we should have, was emotional and mental well-being. We talk about mental health, but we forget that actually in public health, the body's been reduced to disease. But we've got four dimensions to health, the emotional, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, or, or whatever you, you know, similar terminologies to understand the body. And every single person talked about these emotional and mental anxieties. And I think I was saying to Shohini as we were coming over to Savar that we've got sexuality as a taboo, but you've also got emotional health as a taboo in public health, unless you talk about certain emotions, which are then acceptable or legitimate. Okay, next. I'll hurry up. So there's many different issues raised. The obvious ones are violence, harassment, relationships, uh, men's own anxieties about their performance, genital size, and then the more generic women's health. But the key point here is, bless you, the key point here is the me mental and emotional well-beings. We don't have enough connections there. In, in, in the curriculum, even providers were ill-equipped to respond to those sorts of concerns and anxieties. Uh, we took out two videos. It's, uh, videos are very important because it bypasses gatekeepers and teachers and the formal sort of the naysayers that you can't share this information. One was on cyber harassment, which is very common 
and men, young men, because we don't actually talk enough to young men about young men's uh, issues around sexuality and reproductive health. Next. So this was another booklet, and they wanted to include parents. They said that was a huge gatekeeper. Next, I just want to go. So the other study was breaking the shame with young people in rural areas and looking at curriculum and what's missing in curriculum. Next. And this was qualitative research. I'm not going to go into the details, except to say the key findings were, um, can we go to the next slide, that adolescents were perpetually confused. They learned certain things in the book. They had questions about their bodies, their identities, and sexuality that no one talked about. They'd ask the pubbies or the parents or the older sisters, and they got contradictory information. Then they had access to pornography, internet, and they had other kinds of information. So they always said, we're, not, we're, we're confused, and also a lot of these curriculum, they don't give us concrete information on how do you deal with sexual harassment, or how do you use a condom. It's sort of the emphasis on family planning and maternal child health, and there's nothing on emotional and mental health. And adolescents said we struggle with many uh, different uh, issues in our lives, including relationships and navigating these spaces, but there's no one to talk to, or the, the, those who are they're talking to is their friends. So there's a lot of misinformation or information gleaned from informal sources rather than formal sources. Final couple of slides is, this is an issue that came up in our research. We had not planned for it, mental health, emotional health. Yes, sexual health, but it was all about mental and emotional, mental and emotional. And as one student said, I'm so frustrated because I don't know how to manage these emotions. And teachers just say, you know, you, it, it, either you'll be okay or, you know, calm down or you shouldn't be angry. But there wasn't really sufficient explanation or listening. Final couple of slides. We took out a booklet and a short drama on dealing with emotions in Bangla because we felt students should be teaching each other. If, if teachers are often uncomfortable having discussions about emotions, emotions also a new tool. We don't discuss it in public health, let alone talking to adolescents about this. Next slide. We also composed a short drama on relationships and discussions around how do you manage. Young boys talked about self-harm and suicide and being rejected, and young girls talked also about uh, rejection and feeling low and lonely. So there was a lot, all kinds of issues that no one kind of is addressing in the curriculum. Next slide. So we piloted and evaluated some of the findings, and we found there's still a lot more to do. And, stu and young people love videos, they love visual, and they love illustrations. They don't like lots of text, which is obvious, but there was something for us to learn from, but they found it very useful in terms of some of these um, links, and um, we're piloting it in some schools and in some institutions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me with this? Is, is this working? Savannah, for your help. No, I, I just, um, I have a question for you just in terms of conducting the research. Um, did you find that this, the young people were very forthcoming with sharing this with you? I mean, how did you manage to to get accurate data? So it's, it's hard because you get, um, some of the young men are much more forthcoming. It's young women who hold back. But then you have one or two young women who could be, because we worked with BRAC and UBR and MyAPA providers who had access to certain adolescent leaders. And often when a young woman is vocal or outspoken, it opens up spaces for others. Mm -hmm. And I was also surprised because I've worked in slums for about 15 years in rural areas. They're actually quite vocal and open. It's sometimes we as researchers are more uncomfortable asking certain questions. So, I mean, if they feel it's a safe space and there's no parents or teachers, they will share if you can build that trust. And we did, this was a three-year study. So we did repeated visits. It wasn't a one-off interview. So I think you need to build the trust. Build yeah, yeah. But it's not easy, I agree. Yeah. But, but they're quite vocal. Thank you. Um, I think uh, maybe uh, Anand, maybe you can you can share a little bit more about your work with uh, Samyak India. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, as I said, uh, uh, Samyak primarily worked with uh, young men. Uh, uh, let me put it as a biological males uh, who identify themselves as gendered men. So we work with uh, uh, men, and uh, uh, I mean. Because we're talking about uh, you know what kind of how to deal with these barriers and taboos, 
one really need to understand how it really came into practice of development sector. And as we know, uh, post-1994 inter International Conference on Population and Development and post-Beijing, male involvement came as an agenda in reproductive health programs. And that's how it actually came to the discussion table of development agencies to involve men. And many of them actually didn't know what does it mean. So the initial, many of the countries initially used the strategy of involving them into kitchen work, assuming that they might involve into reproductive health care of their wives. I was part of one of such programs in India, and what I realized towards end of seven years that, that you know, men who were part of this program learned how to chop vegetables, but they didn't stop beating their wives. So they learned the language of equality, but their behaviors were not transformed. Right? So one really need to understand engaging, involving men is completely different than working on masculinities. Those are distinctly different areas. And what we mix together is working with men and boys. We started saying the same work as work on masculinities. And we really wanted to separate it politically in our work. And that's how we started working with men because men are pushed towards those masculine norms more while they are also taught about the feminine norms, you know, and that becomes a major block. That becomes a major, major, major block. So interestingly, uh, you know, if I could quote Dr. Sanjay Shivasta, who is a sociology teacher in, uh, uh, in JNU, in Delhi, who says patriarchy gives superiority to every single man, but masculinity gives superiority to only few of them, not all the men. So masculinity becomes a kind of categorization amongst men themselves based on certain set of pursued or attached social, cultural, political qualities. And those are created not just by men and families and through social, cultural uh, socialization. Those are created by nationalism. Those are created by war. Those are created by histories. Those are created by food. Those are created by what kind of animal you uh, live with, etc. And what I think is that, you know, that actually is very difficult to program with, you know. So most of the work with men and boys actually remain to sexual and reproductive health. And there is, there, there need a longer debate about, you know, what are the rights issues in SRH when it comes to men, you know, uh, what, are, what could be the rights issues. So, uh, so, so what Samyak basically realized is that the, the notion of masculinity is necessarily linked with risk taking, performance and violence, and it has got direct implications on the health behaviors or the perceptions and attitudes linked with the sexual and reproductive health. For instance, risk taking is, it becomes a virtue of being a real man, that superior man. So the person would start taking risk in all the spheres of life, not just sexual risks. Yeah, and that is how you see Road traffic accidents are rampant, you know, economic financial risks are rampant, mental health issues linked with and suicides linked with uh, uh, indebtedness is very high in men. Farmer suicide in that sense yeah. are very high. So you see, so risk taking becomes a kind of virtue of manhood and it, is, it gets reflected on the various issues around health. Performance becomes another virtue of being a man. So men are constantly under pressure of performing better in all the spheres of life, not just sexual performances. Sexual performances, yes, but even if, if even they see a, 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 a girl uh, having a, you know, a speeding a bike, you know, they'll start performing a little higher speed than her or any other man for, for that instance, isn't it? So performance becomes an idea and that has direct relationship with the risk taking into health. Uh, behaviors, yeah, or health seeking behaviors for that matter, you know, and that is why possibly we need to really understand why there is so low uh, percentage of young men approaching sexual uh, uh, health services in, in the, and they, they would proudly share about their five girlfriends and six girlfriends and uh, performance and the idea of pleasure without using contraception and you know, uh, so you know, which is which is closely linked with. And lastly, if I could say, violence is also linked with the idea of uh, idea of being a, a man. 
and uh, if i could refer a old study a community based study back in india is that you know women are three time more likely to be beaten up during the pregnancies you know can we see the connection of notion of manhood with sexual reproductive health rights and gender based violence and violence against women and domestic violence and those have been performed through various symbols and various uh, various kind of uh, uh, various kind of practices and i think that uh, what samyak has been trying to do uh, if i have two minute two more minutes to uh, uh, to share about based on these ideas and basically samyak tries to politicize the domain of masculinity not just by helping men to understand sexual reproductive health and rights but to also address risk taking performance and violence in the larger larger sense for instance do we want a very gender sensitive man who is homophobic do we really want a very gender sensitive man who is islamophobic back in india or do we really want and that's that's the question that we ask do we really want a very gender sensitive person man who has gone through these training programs who is now proactively on social media is supporting the war affair <laughs> that has been going on the western borders of india so i think you know i think i think what samyak does through uh, our engagement with this young men is address risk performance and violence in a broader sense and link it to the issues around sexual and reproductive health we believe that if risk taking is the virtue it is highly impossible that the guy will stop taking risk in sexual behavior while he is continuing continue taking risk in other spheres of life so what what i think is that you know that's what uh, that's what the program theory of of uh, samyak is and there are various initiatives that we uh, we try and uh, influence about the especially about the relationships and etc we constantly are keep um, are trying to tell men that how sexual pleasure is been also the per perception of pleasure is been created by uh, by market now you know no, now market is deciding how your body should smell and then you decide what kind of uh, uh, you know what kind of body adorn you want so that you get sexually attractive we try and explain how concept of pleasure has been completely influenced by market now you don't want human sexual fluid flavors now we need strawberries and bananas and chocolates you know to have oral sex and our ideas are completely screwed about the even even, even the sexual pleasures and 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 a link link anxieties you know uh, which are linked with sexuality and sexual reproductive health right So I just stop here. Uh, I would like to respond to other questions when we go ahead. Chocolate and strawberry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'll um, hand it over to um, Dr. Uh, Professor Tohor. Okay. Um, so I uh, look, first let me say that I think one of the most I, I think. the continuing taboos is actually sexuality still even though i must say that in my lifetime in india we've seen a radical transformation i think when i was a student in the 80s studying for my masters in the same university where i teach uh, i don't think i had a single teacher that i could actually address questions about sexuality to and uh, even amongst our, ourselves um, among our friends we didn't talk very much about it i mean everybody had sexual lives but nobody really talked about it like that and i must give it to the lgbt uh, or activism that over that fought uh, you know first for visibility then for decriminalization and not just the activists and the lawyers who were fighting it in courts but the writers the playwrights the dancers you know all the people who built this these themes into their work and created a universe over which this could actually be uh you know the 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 whole idea became popular to everybody now um now we are living through a very different time and uh even when i started teaching in uh, jamia millia islamia which is a university and i teach at the mass communication research center in the early 90s sexuality was just about being you know talked about in the classrooms and i think in some ways my generation of teachers did make a difference because 
our students could actually talk about sexuality in the classroom. Uh, we, did, uh, we screened films that dealt with issues of sexualities. Um, uh, we had festivals of films that dealt with issues of sexuality. But at the same time, in a formal sort of a way, there wasn't any space within academia to talk about sexuality. So if there were women's studies, or people would say gender, and then gender became synonymous with women, so nobody wanted to talk about men. So gender and women became totally synonymous. So then there's another organization that I work with called CREA, and they came up with the idea of doing these sexuality, gender, and rights institutes. So it's like, and all of us, th those of us who were in the, uh, in the academy, we did have our own resources, we had collected a lot of material, we had studied a lot on issues of sexuality, but we didn't actually have a place in which we could share all that. And therefore those institutes, the Sexuality, Gender and Rights Institute, which was like a portable moving institute held over a month in one place in India, actually had a very major impact. And I think it trained an entire new generation of activists who could then take this forward as writers, scholars, lawyers, and that made the hugest difference. So it was like creating a different kind of space. And I think that uh, in India, the 90s was a very important moment because uh, of uh, the you know, economic liberalization, the opening of the skies, the arrival of the satellite channels, and the attendant anxieties. I mean, there were the National C uh, Commission for Women uh, you know, wrote to the Supreme Court of India and said, we want to ban satellite transmission. We don't want all this. In, you know, we don't want this obscenity and vulgarity. And there was a very popular song in the 1990s from a Hindi film called Khalnayak, called Choli Ke Piche Kya Hai, What is Behind the Blouse. And then there were these seminars and workshops on it, and the Human Rights Commission said, Hindi film songs are the worst violators of human rights. And the interesting thing is, and here it tells you something about the South Asian mindset, and that the film Khalnayak had two songs, two, two versions of the Choli Ke Piche song. One was two women singing it together, which was very pleasurable and beautiful and wonderful, and many of you will probably have seen it. The other one was actually the men making fun of the women and doing a parody of it, which ends with the male protagonist actually literally threatening the woman with violence. That never became controversial. What became controversial was the pleasurable affirmative version and everybody said, particularly the Hindu right and many feminists, that it should be banned. And that then you know, tells you uh, something and that how women's assertion of sexuality is seen to be a problem. And also the sense that there were these two women who were kind of uh, you know, uh, indulging in this kind of erotic banter. In the in the uh, late uh, 20th and early 21st century, we had yet another uh, kind of you know, radical transformation in the media with your internet and mobile telephony. And so the entire flow of communication as we know it has got transformed. Uh, so you know, the, our older models of sender, medium, and receiver, that's not there anymore. So we have a very different kind of unprecedented you know, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, virality. So we are no longer just, uh, uh, you know, cons consumers of the media, we are also creators of this media. And I think this new world in which we are immersed in this world of lateral sharing, of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, virality, is something that we are still trying to come to terms with. And I think that uh, all of us who use this uh, need to kind of figure uh, this out much better, and we are all kind of struggling to do that. But I must say this, that in, in the realm of sexuality, uh, the new media the, uh, and this particular digital moment, and particularly the smartphone with which you can actually access it, has opened up new spaces of conversation between absolute strangers, new kinds of intimacies, new kinds of relationships, and this, I think, is actually very, very important and must be preserved. On the other hand, we, we, we continue to have the same kind of antipathy towards sex and sexuality. So there's always some threat of state regulation of obscenity and vulgarity. Uh, you will constantly have, just as you will have various kinds of activists fighting to overthrow that, you will find that the state is somehow 
once again coming up with some kind of a, you know, ICT act or something, or a digital security act or whatever it's called in different countries that is going to try and curb uh, in the name of obscenity and vulgarity your expressions and of sex and sexuality. And that is where these two things come together, the whole business of censorship, because censorship may not uh, exist in the older ways because now we are dealing with newer forms of communication. So it is likely to be there in newer ways and it'll come in newer disguises because people will say, hey, you need protection. Now, in some ways, there are real anxieties uh, and I'm not kind of uh, ignoring those at all. For instance, there is a, a very, very real threat of violation of privacy. That's there. Uh, you know, there is also this risk of disclosure where, you know, your private videos that you know, you might have shared with somebody when you were having sex with somebody has now gone viral, gone to people that, who were not meant to see it. And those are very, very legitimate concerns. And we are struggling with that. But the older, the classic binaries of what is the private, what is the public, all that has become shattered. And we have to, you know, deal with this new world, not with panic and anxiety, but I, I mean, critically, yes. Uh, and certainly not through censorship. Thank you so much. That's a very thought-provoking perspective. Um, I think lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Ashik Saleem before we move on to the more conversational aspect of the panel. Um, Dr. Ashik Saleem is yep. a psychiatrist. He's with the uh, Psychological Health and Wellness Center in Dhaka. Uh, thanks, Ivana. Um, so just while everybody was talking, I was thinking about what I want to talk about. And, um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it specific to my experiences. Um, so, uh, so I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I have studied in Bangladesh and, and abroad, and I've been working as a clinician in Bangladesh for the almost three years now. Um, while I was training, I had um, uh, I had a six-month placement with an adolescent mental health unit um, in the UK, um, and. Uh, prior to that, while I was in medical school, uh, I worked with the Commonwealth Youth Program uh, based in Chandigarh, um, and there was a program called the uh, Youth Ambassadors for Positive Living. So I, I worked for them for a year. Uh, and during that time, um, I did awareness campaigns on uh, HIV AIDS and drug use. Um, so that was uh, during my internship, my medical internship. So my interest in in, in working with, with youth um, and around uh, HIV AIDS at that time and drug use kind of came, came from that time. Um, my training of working with adolescents um, uh, has kind of led the way into my uh, current interests. So right now I'm a specialist in, in adult psychiatry so I, uh, I'm qualified to treat things like depression schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, um, anxiety disorders, uh, and I've also got a subspecialty in addictions. But I have a special interest in, in adolescent mental health. Um, so what was quite interesting is I moved back to Dhaka three years ago and I uh, set up a small clinic um, and I didn't advertise, I just to have told a few friends and family that I'm here. Uh, and very, very quickly, word got around that there's a psychiatrist in town who spends an hour seeing uh, patients rather than just the, the five minutes medication and go away. Um, so I didn't do any marketing and still until now, uh, we've opened a, a bigger company, but I st we still haven't done any marketing. So the people who walk through the door uh, provide, I think to me it provides quite a lot of information. So for me, I have a lot of young people coming in, a lot of young people. Um, and actually, we have a lot of people from the other end of the spectrum. So we have people sort of mid-60 plus into their 70s coming in for psychological interventions. So, um, so we have quite a heavy weight on both ends. So we've got people kind of 25 and under or 65 and over who seem to be most highly represented in my clinic. Uh, it's interesting about why that's the case, and, and maybe we can look at that at some point. But relevant to this 
uh, this panel is the fact that young people are coming in or they're being brought in for uh, interventions for their well-being. Um, some of the, the issues, so if, if I want to kind of um, uh, use some umbrellas, I think from my own experience, one of the biggest difficulties that, that young people are facing these days is that the, the lack of understanding. I mean, just while we were, we were uh, talking before we walked on stage, there was a talk about screens. Now, I can pretty much guarantee that if we do a survey or if, if we look at our phones, um, you can actually you get an app which tells you how long you spend on your phone. Um, and I guarantee that any adult here who has a smartphone has more screen time than their children. But we're anxious about the children's mental health. We're worried about them playing too many video games. We worry about them watching too many cartoons. Whereas I've got friends on Netflix who are watching a series overnight or finishing, um, you know, Breaking Bad in, in, in a week. It, it, it's, it's us who are getting far more screen time. But this isn't the conversation that often. The conversation is about young people. And we're worried about their health. Now, so, so there's a bit of a dissonance there. There's a problem with what we're doing and what we're saying. Young people are facing this. So they're facing that in many different aspects. So technology is one, uh, to the extent where some people are depriving young people of technology and it's gonna make them handicapped. Another way, another issue that comes up is the use of, of intoxicants or the use of drugs. Um, again, uh, one of the things that we find is that uh, with addictions, there's a strong morality uh, or intoxicants, let's, let's, say, let's not say addictions, let's say with intoxicants. There's a strong aspect of morality which goes with it, uh, which means that you know, if you're on this side of the border, you can be sent to rehab for having a drink, whereas on that side of the border, it's something completely normal. Um, we're bringing up our children with, with certain moral aspects and then we're sending them to countries where these aren't valid, um, and then they get confused, they get confused. The third aspect which I find that, that people are, are struggling quite a lot is, is the access to, to technology. And, and by that what I mean is, is, is the exposure and the information that they get. We often talk about providing, um, providing people with information. And I, I often find that uh, quite interesting because there was a time when if I wanted information, I couldn't get it. So I grew up without the internet until I was probably about 18, 19. So at that time, if I wanted to, you know, get access to, you know, say, pornography, I have to find someone to go and buy me a magazine, you know? I mean, it was a lot of work. My son, who's 13, you know, has had access to the internet since he was a toddler. So for him, it's, it's just typing four words and he can get to see what he needs to see. So they have access to information, right? In fact, they may have access to too much information if there is such a thing. I personally don't believe there is such a thing because you, you can never have too much information. But it's a completely opposite problem, isn't it? So at one end, they have all the information and uh, like Shahini said, we have to learn to become uh, critical of the information and teach them to be critical of it. But if we just think about what's happening in their minds where, where the amount of kind of exposure I had was so limited. So the amount of pressures I had to put on myself at that age was quite narrow and quite limited. Whereas this generation is having to make choices, having to navigate difficulties, which we didn't even know existed at their age. Whereas they're having to do all of this to the point where they can become overwhelmed. And it's, it's quite, uh, it's a phenomenon which is happening across the world where you're having middle-aged people kind of towards the end of their uh, second year, third year, university, early 20s, where just apathy is setting in, where there is just too much, they're overwhelmed, and they're, they're forming uh, a depressive syndrome, which isn't typically depressive, but it's more apathy. Um, so I, I think that's, those are the three things I wanted to cover, and I'll be happy to, to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot.
I think we have a number of questions that are coming from the audience through the uh, app, actually. But while we wait for those to come up, I'd just like to present the panel with a question. Um, uh, we heard a lot about the various challenges and complications that the next generation is facing um, when it comes to tackling their own and, and aware, being more aware of their own health. What do you think are some of the best practices in actually addressing those challenges? All of the challenges that you guys have shared in terms of the mixed messages, the access to information, um, the changing, really, I think the bombardment of information that, that the next generation is facing that we didn't necessarily have. Well, I mean, I think uh, maybe, uh, Anand, you can share what worked for Sonia. Yeah, maybe uh, best practices, but best ways to do it, uh, uh, you know, because uh, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I have I have my own reflections around the best practices kind of, you know, labeling certain practices as best, because uh, what works in a kind of, uh, uh, what works possibly as best, best practice in one social cultural, it won't really work in other parts, because of the whole complex nature of South Asia, looking at the caste and class and color and look at the kind of militarization and history of wars and so what I feel is that you know when, when, it, when it comes to masculinity it is very difficult to talk about best practices right but there certainly are best ways that people have tried doing for instance you know what we found is that when we work on the college campuses we, we work uh, it's called youth for equal society yes and what we realized is that every single person is having his own story of socialization, being able to identify what were the points where he learned violence risk-taking performance, help person to reflect on the privileges and whatever power he is enjoying in patriarchy. So what we saw in last decade work with men was completely filled with a lot of symbolism. So tick mark kind of evidences. For instance, you ask any man in this room, uh, is it okay to beat a uh, girl or beat a wife? The very immediate answer would be no. So changed man, tick mark. <laughs> you know, so those kind of evaluations actually brought in a lot of damage because the, practi the, the, the practices with them were not actually taking them through the process of self-reflection and self-transformation, which is a journey for the person himself. So one workshop actually is not going to transform the person. You know? So what I think is that, so informing or sensitizing men had shifted to using transformation, transformatory kind of practices is what is happening good. And that has to be, uh, I think, uh, considered as good practice. Other thing is that you know most of the organizations who are engaging communities try to build the groups which possibly are not organic. What worked for us is that on those college campuses we found the organic gr groups of men. We started working with those men. So not to mobilize 50 men who are coming from all different backgrounds and etc. They never stop together. The attendance is always low. So why not work with a group of people who are not so easy to access? So we never worked with people called National Service Scheme members, which is a National Service Scheme of Government of India. They get credits for that being part of these groups. So we never really worked with them. We always worked with men who are hanging around parking lots, spending their time bunking their classes and sitting in canteens. And it really worked for us because those are always labeled as bad guys. So what I feel is that, you know, working with so-called labeled bad guys actually brought in a lot of energy in this kind of program. So th th there could be many such various ways, which are ways of uh, engaging with these men and on masculinity. For instance, these so-called bad boys actually came up with a very interesting poster uh, as part of, because they didn't really want to do any work on gender and masculinity. They wanted to learn choral draw as a designing software. So there was this negotiation saying, ki, OK, let us have six month Coral Draw course, but poster has to be on risk taking. So obviously, they had to go through the workshops and understand what all kind of risk taking 
risks they are taking. And they actually came up with a poster that says it's okay not to take risks, still you are a man. You know, so there are ways possibly, you know, and those need to be really designed in that settings rather than using it as a best practice. Thanks. Um, I think one of them was, uh, I'm not going to read it out, but about national textbooks and adolescent physical health. I think there's a bigger challenge here where um, the conceptual clarity around gender, sexuality, what we mean by rights doesn't exist. And that's across practitioners, you're talking about teachers, you're even talking about teachers who are teaching this. and. So there needs to be some more discussions and reorientation or orientation around what do we mean? Because it's complex, it's nuanced, and it's also extremely important because we've got people, gender and SRHR is used all the time. What it actually means and, and um, the implications of teaching that is, is you know, uh, understanding that. Um, and I also think we, I haven't done research on government, but we've been approached by government to do training or at least work with them. How do you develop tools or bypass um, traditional gatekeepers? Because sometimes in some places, teachers will never be comfortable teaching certain subjects. But there's also other ways of reaching out to students or individuals who are interested in learning. So we can also look at innovative ways of giving information and Brack's done it, and many organizations have done it, but it needs to be strengthened and improved. Another quick response is, um, uh, I can't remember, but it was something else on working with the transgender. We actually work with them and they're co-facilitating short courses with us. So while we've been doing a five-year capacity building of our own uh, uh, schools of uh, team members, we had uh, transgender individuals from the transgender community participate in that training and then they were involved in taking forward some courses with us. So. In that sense, yes, there's research, but we also work together in terms of some of the training um, in the last few years. How do you measure the impact of actions on behalf of young girls? I, I'm not sure about this question. It's very broad. Um, it depends on which research, what you're talking about, what I'm measuring. How do you define measurement, unintended, intended consequences? It could be a particular project or a particular shift in terms of social norms. So, I'm going to leave it at that, but I'm quite happy to have an individual conversation. Um, yeah, thank you. You know, I had a question actually for you. Uh, you know, since you are working with uh, young people who, you know, uh, who are into substance abuse, or you s and you introduced me to a new word today called chemical youth. Uh, oh no, you said it. one of you did. I don't know who, about chemical youth. Uh, yeah. 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 So it's a kind of a more non-judgmental term, you know, because drug abuser or drug addict, they come loaded with morality. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, even when I look at my students, I can see that they are users. And um, some of them are okay with it, I mean, in the sense that it doesn't really get into the way of their work. And with others, it does get a bit out of hand. But I'm very much often at a loss as to how I can start a conversation around it. And I was wondering whether you could help me with that a little bit by just sharing some of your experience. Yeah, no, that's a very good question, and, and it's it's um, I, I think it's quite similar to when you know uh, the other day we had a question where someone said, "When do you start talking to your children about sex?" And I said, "Well, I, I you know I said you never not talk to them about sex. You 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 normalize it from from the beginning." I find with addictions it's the same thing. Um, that we, we, we often find it difficult to start a conversation because we haven't had an ongoing conversation. So, so students, yes. So, so it's the same thing. It's, it's that, that when, um, that for example, if, if you know, in your um, uh, inductions, so in at the beginning, when the student enters the university, if they find that the institution or department is actually a friendly place where they can talk about issues which we are identifying as taboo. So if there are awareness posters or if there are counselors or if there are mentors or if there are advocates, then immediately they will feel that, oh, you know what? 
a safe space so I can talk about it or you will also feel that you will be able to talk about it. So um, I find that when I uh, approach people uh, to talk about addictions, uh, I, I, very, um, I very soon tell them that I identify myself as an addict of caffeine because I, I am a caffeine addict. Uh, there are many people in this room who are nicotine addicts. Now, um, now, if you identify yourself as an addict, then immediately it's easier to then, I mean, in our panel, we were walking around looking for a coffee. It, it's because we needed some caffeine. And, and that it gives us, uh, it straight away gives us a, a bit of empathy. Drugs can become problematic. And when they become problematic, then they need to be identified and talked to with a specialist. But drug, it's very important to be able to distinguish between usage, a normal usage of a drug or a chemical, or uh, between that and a problematic use. So exactly, so even addiction is more, um, so for example, uh, a person might say, you know what, I don't drink all week, but on the weekend I'll have a bottle of whiskey. Now that's problematic, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, but that's problematic because then their weekend is spent um, uh, suffering, right? So so they could be they could be productive or they could be fulfilling other roles of their life, but they can't do that because they drank too much the night before. So it's a problematic drug use. But he's not addicted. The question here is, is masculinity and its impact similar across cultures, both in the West and East? Uh, so certainly not. Uh, uh, not just about East and West, but uh, it may not be even same in different cultures within a geographical, uh, geographical, within a geographical settings like Bangladesh, like India, like, you know, because uh, one thing that you need to really uh, understand is that, you know, Jay, Masculinity is not a standalone concept. You know, it is very much part of the gender construct. Like masculinity, femininity is also constructed. And as gender is constructed in a given culture, in a given society, at the given point of time, so similar applies to masculinities also. So you won't be able to, what, what finds a Punjabi man and uh, what, what, what is a, how to describe a Bangla, Bangla man and how to describe a Maratha man is completely different. So certainly uh, it's not. And there was one question that flashed and went off. Do we really work with uh, contraceptions where uh, most of the methods are with girls? Yes, do we do with young men. We run a helpline called Marzi. Now, Marzi is a Marathi, Hindi, and Urdu word, which, 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 which translates as choice. Uh, so that provides information about the contraception. And, and we, uh, we, we have started uh, uh, mapping the use of emergency contraceptive pills. Uh, those have been bought over the counters in India, and which, ha which has gone really very high. It has got implication on the women's health, though women have choice of, uh, uh, you know, uh, control. But, you know, but uh, we are promoting, we are hel helping men to get into, uh, mm, we're using market for that, and you know, the market ideas for that. For instance, you know, there are more dotted uh, condoms are available now. Why don't we really go for that? So pleasure, basically redefining pleasure in that sense. So we do, we do work we on contraception. I just wanted to address that question about what are the models in terms of breaking these taboos? What's been more effective? I think it's more about, um, it's not either or. I think it's really about different kinds of messaging, but also very careful about how we Sometimes we rush through content because we're so busy with the, <laughs> the, the scaling and sharing the messaging. And the worry is that if you don't get the content right, because you're dealing with many different kinds of groups, you also have different kinds of needs identified. So what do you focus on as you're trying to break what taboos and what levels? And I think, um, I mean, I remember meeting these young kids who uh, use cartoons. They develop cartoons for their own sort of younger groups to, to, to find out about sexual education because they weren't finding it. I don't know, this was years ago at a meeting somewhere in Indonesia where I went somewhere. And then in Dhaka, the LGBT community have developed very nice, also cartoons and videos to reach out to others. So there are many different ways, I think, of and, and, and options and sometimes even involving young people but also stakeholders. 
um, I don't think there's any fixed way, and I think some of it's just learning uh, through it. But yeah, campaigns, media, social media, since I heard, yeah. I think um, one of the things we were talking about before is this this question of social media, and I think that um, it's, it's agreed that it does create a lot more anxiety, um, you know, for some. But I think there's also an opportunity in terms of raising awareness and addressing these taboos. Can any of you speak to that? There are certainly a few experiences, you know, to, to break the taboos through social media. For instance, uh, for instance, I remember this campaign done by one of the uh, gay activist groups where they promoted condoms through making a fun appeal. So they had this cartoon of condom man. And this condom man goes from this, uh, it's like Spider-Man. The condom man, condom man goes from here and there. And wherever he sees that there is something happening, uh, sex activities happening, then he enters the room, OK? So then, you know, so then, then they also came up with this, you know, colorful condom series. And they started circulating through social media uh, 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 on, on various occasions. For instance, there is something called, you know, during the Pavali, they started using uh, uh, lamps, you know, you know, which are decorated with colorful condoms, and something like that. So, so using culture, you know, changing, uh, uh, seeing what, what is the block in a taboo. If it is a cultural block, cultural taboo, then addressing, using the culture, culture as the site to address the taboo, and using humor. Because we always we have we said about this, you know, since long about uh, we, we completely connected this uh, condom taboo with disease and risk, you know, isn't it? I mean, we never really use fun appeal for that. So it could be. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to mention, oh, please wrap up, okay. Um, yeah, no, I, just about social media and, 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 and that, um, that we often we underestimate the the impact of that social media can have in a positive way, and we often uh, think we we like you mentioned the anxieties around it, but um, uh, but I guess if we if we just learn to to critique uh, the information we get, uh, then obviously it, it's it's. Uh but just the li one uh, one line before wrapping up, and that is w uh, one of the things that the communication studies still show is that one of the most effective way of communicating still is interpersonal communication. We shouldn't give that up. Thank you so much. Thanks for the great questions and to the wonderful panelists. I think this was just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the challenges that we're facing. I hope we can all continue the conversation. Um, and I, I really strongly believe that addressing these taboos and really empowering youth to take control of their own health is, is the only way that certainly in Bangladesh we're going to continue to achieve the growth that, that we have achieved in, um, in recent years. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.